Spike, what are your general rules for raising money for films? I mean, what do you advise your NYU students when the subject comes up? What kind of guidance do you provide them? Well, I've been teaching at NYU for the past 15 years, and uh, the issue is whether you're in film school or not film school, where you get the money to shoot, where you get the money to for completion, to finish your film. And I tell people, you just have to be inventive and you gotta look under every nook and cranny to get it done. There's not, there's not, there's nothing I could tell somebody that's gonna be like the golden trail and you're gonna find a pot of gold. And, you know, at, at the end, is that's just not the way this industry works. So there's no set roadmap, but I'm wondering, is there a certain mindset? Are there certain characteristics, whether they're temperament, whatever, that you tell someone? Um, well, I think that when you want to, when you're looking for money, you have to have, a, you have to be tough, tough as nails and not be uh, deterred by no's. All it takes is that one person, that one grant, that one scholarship, you know, money can show up and fall out of the sky sometimes. I mean, that's not the, something that, that you have to wait for. One of my, one of my own most favorite quotes is by Brooklyn Dodger owner Branch Rickey who signed Jackie Robinson. And the quote is this, Luck is a residue of design. So, if you're working and busting your ass, you have a better chance of luck smiling down upon you. But you're just chilling and not extending any injury, excuse me, not extending any energy. No get it from go. And you're not we're not seeing that elbow grease. We're not seeing initiative. We're not seeing that blood, sweat, and tears. Very rarely will you find yourself in a lucky situation. Speaking of which. But you, but you can't depend on luck, though. You can't depend on luck. I've been very lucky. Uh, be honest, when I decided I want to be a filmmaker, there was only one African American director working in Hollywood. His name was Michael Schultz, director of one of my favorite films, Cooley High. And so when I would tell my African American friends, you know, they're like, do black people, they let black people direct films? And so I never ever thought about the odds. A lot of times you think about stuff like that, it could be a self-inflicted paralysis. But uh, I knew what I wanted to do. And I was uh, committed that through hard work, God willing, something will break my way and it happened. Out of the 50 plus movies you've directed and produced, which was the hardest to find financing for? Well, I would definitely have to say the first one, She's Gonna Have It, which cost $175,000. Because that was my debut film as far as a feature film, as feature films go. And people think that I did that film right after film school. There was a four year period between me finishing NYU and She's Gonna Have It coming out. So it was not like that. And then another one would be uh, Malcolm X. We ran out of money and they had to go get some money too. Does it ever get easier? What's easy? Well, it's easy. I mean, if it was easy, you know, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have launched a Kickstarter campaign. This, this, uh, we're in day five. 
So uh, it's a tough business, you know. You know that's and I really and E can I can tell you he's one of my students, and every time I'm here in LA, he helps me. But I do not try to sugarcoat things all to my students, and uh, it would be a great disservice to them if I did that. So I let them know, you know, this this is no guarantee it's going to happen for you. We shot she's going to have we. We shot She's Gonna Have It in 1985. We were doing Kickstarter before there was Kickstarter. We just didn't have the technology. I was making phone calls, making personal visits, writing letters. So we did everything except social media, which, which social media was not around then. Do you think that people that are already established mm -hmm. are taking away, quote, chances from the little guys? No, look, I understand why people might think that, but that's not the case at all. I'm bringing people to Kickstarter who never even heard of Kickstarter. I'm talking a lot of people of color who've never heard of Kickstarter, who've never made a pledge. Um, Kickstarter. So I really think that it's a fallacy, it's a misconception, and it's just played out, it's just playing out wrong with the capital W that because someone puts five dollars on my film, someone who backs my film with five dollars, that was five dollars that a young filmmaker was gonna get. And that logic does not does not follow through. I mean, there there is concrete evidence with what Mr. Thomas did with Veronica Mars and what Zach did with his film. People, majority of people who backed those things had never been on Kickstarter before. But I think those people back films after that once they were once they made were made the introduction to Kickstarter. So to be honest, I know the question. I know that I mean, look, I know you had to ask this question, so it's cool. The two co founders of Kickstarter told me that, you know, Ron Mr. Thomas had flack, he caught flack. Zach caught flack. Zach Flack, and that I would get the same. So this is not a surprise at all. But this this is uh, I've been hearing stuff from the very first film. She's gonna have it was a negative portrayal of black women. School days, I was airing dirty laundry. Do the right thing would make black people run amok and riot all across the country when it came out. I was anti-Semitic because my characters, Joe and Mo and Josh Flatbush in Mo Better Blues, so I just roll with the punches and keep going. And the fact that I'm here in my third decade making films is concrete evidence of that. And I'm gonna keep, Kurosawa was 85, 86 when, so you know, I don't know if I can go that long, but I have many, many more films, many, many, many more stories to tell. And this little, I'm gonna use a word on you, this little brouhaha about Spike Lee is comes in Bogart and Kickstarter, and he's taking advantage of the young up and coming filmmakers. Is 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 as Mike as my good friend Mike Tyson would say is ludicrous. For example, why would I be teaching for the past fifteen years at NYU if I did not care about young filmmakers? 
why would I be the artistic director of NYU Graduate Film School if I not care about young filmmakers? Why have I given that over, over $20,000 in the Spike Lee Production Fund to young filmmakers at NYU if I not care about young filmmakers? So people say what they want. The truth is the truth. So for a filmmaker that does have that mindset that, oh, a name is taking away from, quote, our backers, that'll back our little zombie short, do you think they have the right <laughs> mindset to make it in the film business as brutal and as difficult as it is? Do you think that's setting them up with the right mindset? Look, I understand why they feel that way, but why they, the reasons they feel that way are, are ill-conceived. It's just not true. And they, they just got to work hard and make sure that their stuff is tight so when people do look at their links that they'll want to back them. Is it a cutthroat game to get to your level? Do you think people realize how hard that is? Oh, I think people realize, I mean, that's one of the reasons why, uh, I mean, some of these young filmmakers have had those feelings towards Vampire Mars, Zach Braff, myself, because it is a tough business. But here's the thing. We are not some pirates showing up a rape and pillar I've been always been more than generous with my time and money young filmmakers and that will continue always and if and I've told this to Yancey and Perry who are the co-founders of Kickstarter that if we make any profits, I will set up an endowment so that the dividends could go to young filmmakers on Kickstarter. I believe you said in an interview with NYU that you can't stand a lazy student. Right. What do you see in most independent filmmakers, however old they are, that makes them lazy and that hinders their career? Well, I don't want to make a blanket statement about independent filmmakers, but I've had students who are lazy, and laziness is something I really can't tolerate. So, because of laziness, I think that that speaks of a sense of entitlement. And that's just not a good look in this industry, where you think that you are entitled to something that you de you deserve something because you're wherever you think you are. It doesn't work like that. Another thing I like to add is that, and I'm, I'm speaking about my school. A lot of people come out of NYU thinking that because you have this degree from this prestigious prestigious institution, NYU or USC or AFI Columbia, in the real world, they don't really give a shit. You know, if you don't have the talent, that degree doesn't mean a thing. When you come out of school, you should have, if you're a director, you should have a film. If you're a DP, you should have a reel. Editor, you should have a reel. If you're a screenwriter, you should have scripts. So people, want, people really want to see the work you've done. Is it harder to raise 25 million to make a film, uh, or is it harder to raise one or two million for a smaller film? I mean, does it are the stakes raised? I'll tell you what. Same? Dance is easy. It's harder to raise a million than twenty-five million. Why? Because there's just this mindset that a film costs a million dollars. There's very little want to see, or very little. Return of investment 
in a film that small. So it's almost that mindset that kind of you get what you pay for in terms of, let's say... I wouldn't say that. Or, I'm just saying there's a, a prejudice against films under a million. 